All right. Now, um, obviously, today's July 6th. We're, set, we're coming off a celebration of, of the 4th of July, Independence Day. Um, you know, a lot of people or people who lived back in the country in 17, 1776 decided they had enough of the tyranny and, and the abuses of government, and they decided to declare their in independence from the British government. And of course, we're celebrating. We celebrate that fact on, on Friday, the, you know, kind of the birth of our country. And um, there's a lot of celebration of freedom and liberty, you know, being free from tyranny. And that's what I'm going to be preaching on this morning is that subject of liberty and freedom and how important it is in our lives and how we can attain that freedom and liberty. Now, I, I believe that God has instilled in us as human beings a desire to naturally want to be free. I mean, humans do not want to be in bondage, do not want to be in slavery to anybody. God has innately given us that desire to, to just want to be free. Um, however, there's also a lot of wicked people out there that are looking to enslave others. They're looking to, to, to you know, direct them and control their lives. And obviously that's why you, you, all throughout history there has been these tyrannical governments and groups of people that get together, mobs, gangs. You know, they want to justify themselves and a lot of times they'll call themselves government. And it's just to oppress other people. And you know, the devil wants you enslaved too. And that's ultimately where I believe all this comes from this as the root cause and that source is from the devil. And um, you know, I believe the best way to enslave people is basically to make them think that they're not enslaved. And, and that's the way that you're going to keep people under control the longest is, is, is by making them think in their minds, oh yeah, I'm not really a slave, when in fact they are. And um, that's exactly what's going on today. And, and just a little illustration to, to let you know kind of what I'm talking about with this. A good example of that, I believe, is the income tax. You know, during the congressional hearings and stuff, the IRS will tell you and say, oh, yeah, our U.S. tax system is all based on a voluntary, it's a voluntary basis. That sounds great, right? It's a, you hear that and you're like, oh, yeah, it's voluntary. That's great. That's, you know, it's free, right? It's freedom. People just, just give if they want to or not. Well, yeah, try not paying your taxes <laughs> and see how voluntary it is at that point um, if you end up going to jail or not as a result of, of voluntarily deciding, you know what, I don't want to pay into this because I don't agree with how you're spending my money and I don't want to fund abortions and the death of children and going out and bombing people in other countries that have nothing to do with us. But um, we'll see how voluntary that system is. But they tell you this and they use these words to trick you, to deceive people into thinking that, oh, everything's legitimate, everything's just fine. And I think about how much freedom do we even really have today? You know, we tout ourselves in a, as a country, as the United States, as being, you know, this, free, this great bastion of freedom and liberty. And if you want to compare it to other countries, you know, I will say, sure, we, you know, the United States does experience a lot more freedom and liberty than many other countries throughout the world. But what is the comparison based on? I mean, is it just based on someone who's, who's even more oppressed? Or is it be based on the fact that we truly are free and liberated from bondage? And, and I would rather just be completely free than just compare myself to some other nations that are even less free. Right? That's, that's not how I want to, that's not the, the amount of freedom I want is just based off of someone who's just in total slavery. Right? I, I, I want to strive to have the liberty and the freedom to do a lot more than what we have the freedom and liberty to do today. Now, um, to explain this a little bit too, who knows what the word license means, right? The word license. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of the younger generation, they don't know what this word really means because it's become so ingrained in our society of just it's normal to get licenses. You know, you need to get a driver's license. You need to get a business license. You need to get all these different licenses to do things. That word license means permission. If you think about that word, if you, if you want to get a license for something, what you're doing is you're asking for permission. We saw this um, back in the book of Acts. We just got done um, preaching through the book of Acts on Wednesday nights when Paul had, had wanted to, to speak unto the people and the, um, the, the guard that was holding him gave him license to speak. It means he gave him permission to speak unto the people. Now, you think about if you, ask, if you have to ask for permission to do something, that means that whoever you're asking is the one that is perceived to have that authority over you to allow you and to not allow you to do those things. So think about all the things that we need licenses for these days. I mean, you need a license. If you just want to go out to the stream and just, and just catch some fish, 
You need permission to do that. If you want to go hunt, if you want to provide for your family, you know, I go out and I hunt. I like to, to hunt elk and, and get some meat to be able to provide food for my family so that we could eat. You know, I don't hunt for sport. I don't care about the trophy on the wall. I just want to provide food for my family. And I want to get some healthy food, you know, animals that go out in the free range, you know, whether it be fish, whether it be, you know, animals, yet the government says, well, no, you need permission to go out and do that. You need to get the okay, you need to pay us some money and say, okay, now you're allowed to go out and eat the animals that, that God has provided for us and has given us dominion over. And as, as lawfully, according to God's word, you know, he's the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the one who, who all these animals would belong to, and he's given us dominion over them, yet we have this government in place now tell us, well, no, you need to have a license to do that. You need permission. You need permission to, to own a, a piece of machinery that will allow you to, to transport yourself from, from one location to another. You need to have permission to operate a piece of machinery to drive you across, you know, town or whatever. You need to have permission to open up a business. And just, and just say, hey, I've got this service I want to provide. I want to, I want to help people out. I want to earn some money. Well, in many cases, you need to have a license and you need to have permission from the government to do that. Even getting married these days now, you, just, you need to get permission from the government to get married. And what business does the government have in allowing me to marry my wife? I don't know. I thought that was a vow that I make between me and my wife and before God and in the church but you know apparently the government decides no we're going to give you a license to get married we're going to allow you or disallow you to get married building on my own property i you know I, I feel like i own this house or this property that we're on but no if i want to build anything if i want to build a shed if i want to do any kind of building on my land you need a license for that even burning your waste doing you know the list goes on and on and on and on you know anyone who's, who's been around for a while you know all the different licenses that we need to get that's just all permission and you think about, you know, where this country's going. It's not, it hasn't always been this way either. I mean, these, these laws are just, just piling on and piling on and piling on. And the more laws you have, the less free you are. I mean, laws are restricting you from doing things. That's what they're doing. Um, and I'm not saying, and we're going to get to this a little bit later. I'm not saying there's need for no laws. Of course we need laws. But when you start having, you know, ridiculous stupid laws of man instead of the laws that God has provided for us that's when you start getting into bondage and that's when you know you start losing your freedoms I mean basic things of traveling being able to defend yourself you know feeding your family these are all basic rights that we all have that shouldn't be infringed upon and I even you know I mentioned my, my land you're know, building on my land we don't even own the land anymore Anyone who owns any piece of ground, or at least if you think you own a piece of ground, you're all paying taxes on it. Which means that you have somebody, again, what happens if you don't pay those taxes? They're either going to send you to prison or they're going to take your land away from you. So if you have a piece of land, do you really own it if you have to just pay money to somebody else in order to keep that, in order to maintain that, in order not to be, to be cast into prison? It seems more like rent to me. But so anyways, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things going on in this country. What do we do about it? What, what do we do? How, do? how do we take care of all these issues? How do, we, how do we deal with a loss of liberty or loss of freedom? Now, I mentioned in my, one of the sermons I preached at the camping trip that, um, you know, I don't believe that the solution is, is political. Uh, a lot of people, and you know, I, I was thinking when I first started getting involved with church, and start getting right with God, you know, I could see the injustices going on and I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to make a change in this world. I wanted to do something and say, you know what, I don't like what's going on. I want to change things. And I, and I at first kind of thought that, that I can do that during the political process, but in my opinion now, I, I've grown to, to, to come to the conclusion that that's just vanity. It's, it's, it's just going to be a waste of time trying to get through the political process to change things. And the reason why is because I think that there's a much deeper problem than just the surface of dealing with politics and government. And it's a spiritual problem. And it's something that you need to reach the hearts and minds of the individual. And it's not going to be dealt with just by you know, passing legislation through a Congress or through, you know, through some form of human government. We need to get right with God in order to receive our, our liberty and our freedoms that we deserve. Um, and, and we will deserve it if we are right with God. All throughout the Bible, all throughout history, when nations start becoming wicked, when the people, not the governments, when the people themselves start getting wicked, start sinning, start just allowing all kinds of perversion, 
That's when God judges those people and this judgment is comes in the form of bondage. That's when people are going to come in. You're going to have people come in and invade you. you. Think about the children of Israel. All throughout the history, you can read through the book of Judges. You read through the Kings, the Chronicles. What happened is every time they turned away from serving the Lord, someone would come in and attack them. And then they'd lead them away captive. And then it was when they got their hearts right with God, what did God do? Then God would step in. He'd bring a deliverer and bring them back into the land and bring them back into their freedom, bring them back into their posterity. And it, it's, a, it's a cycle that just continues over and over again. And if we truly want to be a free people, if we truly want to have that freedom, we need to reach the hearts and minds of the individuals. And that's why instead of myself choosing to go into a career in politics, I decided, you know what, no, I want to reach people and, and bring them the truth and the truth from the Bible, not just some philosophies of freedom, not just the philosophies of men, but, but the truth from God's word and try to convince people and persuade people, first of all, to find Christ and to get saved, which is what we saw here in the opening text. But second of all, to get right with God and to walk according to his word so that God can protect us and to give us his protect us, give us his defense and um, to keep us from tyranny of, of being in bondage. Now let's look where we were in Isaiah chapter 61 because the first thing that people need to know is the truth from God in, in salvation. In Isaiah 61, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now the Bible also says in, in, in 2 Corinthians 3.17, it says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Spirit of the Lord is what brings liberty. And you notice there in verse number 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. This is quoted um, and actually is read by Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 4. If you want to flip over to Luke chapter 4, we're going to see where Jesus reads out of the book of Isaiah here in, from Isaiah, Isaiah 61. God's Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, is what brings liberty. It brings freedom. It liberates us. And when the Spirit of the Lord here is, comes upon Jesus Christ, as we see, look at Luke 4, look at verse number... Um, let's start reading in verse number 16. It says, and, it, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Um, and he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And, um, you know, of course, Jesus is preaching. He is the one that came to preach the gospel to the poor. And you notice that there in, in verse 18, he's, you know, it's quoting Isaiah 61 where it says, He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. In Isaiah 61, it says, He hath anointed me to preach good tidings. Good tidings is good news, right? That's, that's good news. That's where we get our des uh, definition for the word gospel. The word gospel simply means good tidings or good news. That's the good news that we need to bring. And in that good tidings, in, that, in the gospel, that is going to... Um, bring liberty that uh, that proclaims liberty to the captives the opening of the prison to them that are bound you know freedom is obviously is a wonderful thing and we should want to proclaim that liberty to the captives that's something that that ought to be in your heart that if you're saved this morning hey you're free from the curse of the law you're free from that sin and that hell punishment on our sin and um Amen if you're saved and, and that's you this morning. But you ought to want to also not just be free yourselves, but to help free others. And um, just think about this. Uh, the, um, you know, we have this reference of a prison. Imagine a prison full of people. They've been taken captive. They're shut up behind the gates. And uh, maybe it's a, pris a prison full of like prisoners of war. Right? You have, you, have a, you have a death camp. You have these prisoners of war. And they're all your countrymen. 
and they're in this they're in this camp they're locked up and you knew how they can get out and you have access to go and tell them how they can get out now what would you do with that would you go and, and tell them so that they could be free or would you just say no you guys can just go ahead and, and be put to death right this is an illustration that that he's using here with the prison I mean think of how amazing that would be to go and just tell them be like hey this is how you get out you know there's actually there's this trap door down here and you guys can go and everybody can escape and be free and you could go and be a part of that and let them know and tell people about that well that's exactly what we need to do with salvation there's a lot of people out there that are on their way to hell they're captive by their sin they're in bondage to their sin and we need to go bring and proclaim liberty unto the people proclaim the truth and explain hey Jesus Christ died and he paid for your sins on that cross and all you need to do is put your faith in him in order to be freed from that bondage be free from that curse of the law and um, and you'll be saved forever it's everlasting life you need to be saved one time and that's something that we need to to be able to bring out and proclaim that message that um, that Jesus Christ brought in Luke chapter 4 that we saw there the only way to be truly free is through Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, um, go ahead if you would please turn to Romans chapter 6 where we're going there next. But in John 8, 31, the Bible says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And Jesus is explaining to the Jews here, he's saying, Look, if you continue in my word, and that's where he said first in verse 31, he was talking to those who already believed. People who are already believers, he says, if you continue in my word, if you follow me, if you obey, if you obey the commandments, if you, if you follow me, if you continue in that word, then you, are you my disciples. See, not every believer is a disciple of Jesus Christ. A disciple is someone who's actually following, someone who's actually going out and doing the work and, and, you know, and, and trying to live right and doing everything right. You can be a believer and not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The disciple is someone who's actually walking the walk and not just believing in their heart. Right? All it takes for a person to be saved is to believe in their heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead to save them for their sins. That is what gets you saved. But if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to continue in his word. He says if you continue... Bondage, because even after you're saved, you can fall into sin. You could start, you know, a, a saved person can become an alcoholic, or maybe ne was already an alcoholic and never and never, you know, changes that aspect of your life. Hey, if you put your faith in Christ, you're saved. But if you're if you decide to continue doing that, you are in bondage. You're in bondage to that sin, and you need to you need to to change that and start following Christ, continue in His Word, so that you can be made free. By, by following and continuing in the truth. And this is why, you know, um, you know we, we place a high value on truth here. The Bible says that the truth shall make you free. We care, we value the truth very highly. We're not here just to hear lies. You know, there's a lot of churches around that, that they'll tickle your ears and they'll lie to you just because it sounds good and it sounds pleasant and it's something that, that you know, you might want to hear. But... What we care about is the truth. Now, oftentimes the truth is great. It's wonderful. It's, it's good news. It's glad tidings. But a lot of times the truth isn't always so nice. Maybe you're doing something that God does, disapproves of. And nobody really likes to be told that they're doing something wrong. It's something that could sting. It's something that, that you have to deal with. But we're not here just to, just to, just to put smiles on people's faces. And we're looking for people who are interested in just hearing the truth. Because ultimately the truth will make you free. And this is also why we preach on sin and on God's commandments so much here. Is because it's the truth and the truth will make you free. And um, we want to be free from that bondage. And in order to even know that you're in bondage, you need to understand what sin is. You need to understand the things that you do in your life that are wrong. So that you can be freed from that bondage. Now with this freedom, with any freedom, anytime you're at liberty, you're at free, 
it also it always comes with an extreme responsibility right what the more freedom that that a person has and individuals have in general the more individual responsibility lies with that person if you're the more you're free to do obviously you are going to be held accountable for the things that you do um, and this is something that God promotes and God deals with and, and encourages is individual liberty and individual responsibility so that we can be responsible for our own actions. Um, we live in a world today that, that basically they want to make the state God and try to keep everybody safe at the expense of their, own, of their liberty. They'll say, well, you need to, to give up this freedom and that freedom and this freedom because... Basically, we can't trust you to have that freedom because there's too many people out there that'll abuse it. So, in order for you to be safe, we just you just can't have the freedom to do those things. Um, you know, they're they're going real hard against being able to carry firearms and weapons these days. Um, it's always been under attack, but it seems to be under extreme attack these days. And they'll point to instances where people go out and and you'll have some nut go and kill people and commit some horrible sin. And they'll say, see, look, you can't be trusted with guns. So we're not going to allow you to have that freedom anymore. We're going to collect all the guns and then no one will get shot because we'll have all the guns and you can't have them anymore. And you could say, oh yeah, that sounds great. You know, we'll be safe. But <laughs> Think about, think about a maximum security prison, right? Here's, here's part of the problem with that logic, with, with allowing the government to say, okay, you can take away our freedom, you can take away our liberty in order to keep us safe. Well, the most safe you could be, you think, is maximum security, right? I want the maximum security. I want to be as safe as possible. And they use that term for a prison where there's a bunch of people caged up and locked up to try to prevent you know, anything bad from happening, to try to keep these people separate. And it's supposed to be a place where they're kept safe, but they're kept locked up, and it's maximum security. But this is such a great example. If anyone knows anything about maximum security prisons and what a joke it is, and, and it just kind of illustrates how incompetent the state is for actually being able to provide safety and security for the people because I mean maximum security prisons is places you got drugs going in there you've got people being killed you've got all kind everything that happens out here happens in there and a lot of times it happens even worse you hear all these stories of people who commit various crimes that that aren't even like um, you know violent crimes or anything like that um, maybe some kind of stealing or theft or, or not even that there's, there's all there's all kinds of different crimes that people get thrown into prison for and um, oftentimes what happens is they come out even worse than when they went in because now they're in this in this whole other um, <laughs> like there's a whole different law of the land inside of the prison system and and people it's it's a lot more corrupt and and people end up coming out worse than they went in and this is just just to give you an idea of what, you know, if you want to trust the state to keep you safe, of what you're going to get in return. And um, today we just have a bunch of politicians trying to deceive you into giving up your freedom by making you think that you're not really becoming a slave, but we're really just going to keep you safe. Now, as Christians, we also have a great responsibility because we are free from our sin. We're free from the curse of the law. But just because we are free from the law does not mean that we should just keep sinning and continue in sin. Romans chapter 6 tells us that. Look down at verse number 1. The Bible says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the context back from chapter number 5 is saying that, Look, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So, the fact that we're covered by Jesus Christ's blood, he shed all of his blood for our sin. Even if I sin next week, next year, all the sins that I continue to do for the rest of my life, they're paid for by Jesus Christ. He paid for every single one on the cross. And in context, he's saying, well, sh should we continue in sin that grace may abound and just increase more and more and more that that grace just continues to cover all of your sins? He says, God forbid. God forbid that we should continue in sin. He says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. Jump down to verse number 15 of Romans 6. It says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Which is true. We are not under the law. We are under God's grace if you're saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. But he says, God forbid that we should just, just because we're not under that curse of the law does not mean that we should just go out now and just, and just commit sins. 
Verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you decide to say that just because I'm free from that curse of the law, I'm going to start sinning, you're going to be brought into bondage of that sin. You're going to become a servant to that sin. But that's why he's saying, you know, you should be um, a servant unto righteousness and unto the good things of God, not unto your sin. And um, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, because here's another uh, passage that explains one of the reasons why it's so important not to, to continue in sin. First Corinthians chapter eight. We start reading verse number four. The Bible reads, "Is concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other god but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him." Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Are we the worse. So he's explaining here that, you know, and starting in verse number four, that we know that there's these things, you know, there's these idols, they're called gods. But we know they're not really gods. We know that that's just, that's just a fake god. That's not the true god. And basically he's saying that you know, meat doesn't commend us to God. He says whether we eat or not, it doesn't make us any better or worse. You know, there's nothing special about that food. But um, you know, even though we know these things, we have this knowledge that, that, that food doesn't really, it doesn't mean anything that it's offered unto, a, unto an idol. He says, but look at verse number 9, it says, But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? So he's saying, look, you might have this liberty, this freedom, but just because you have it doesn't mean that you should just use it in that way because when other people see that, they could become weak and say, oh, okay, and, and they, look, they view it. You're not eating it as a thing offered unto an idol, but you could look at it and they'll say, oh, look, here's a Christian. You know, they're, they're eating this as, you know, as something sacrificed to an idol, and they could stumble and, and fall. That could be a stumbling block to them. And it says in verse 12, it says, But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So it is a sin, and we see in, in, um, in other chapters that it is a sin for a Christian to eat uh, meat, sacrifice unto idols. Now, we don't seem to have that much of a problem with that these days. You know, there's um, idolatry. Um, there's still idolatry today. It's not the same as it was back then, but um, there's definitely, think about this. If you were to go into a Catholic church, right, that is full of idolatry. And if you were to partake in their Eucharist, and, and you could say, well, what's the big deal? I mean, it's just a wafer. It doesn't really mean anything. But someone else were to see you do that, they could think, oh, okay, well, here's someone who claims they believe the Bible and they're Christian, so they're going and partaking of this. It's not a big deal, right? And um, I think oftentimes, don't they do that at weddings? Sometimes they'll give, they'll give the, the Eucharist or um, I think I've been to places like that. Maybe they only do that for the, for the bride and the groom now. I don't know. But, um, you know, I could think of a situation, just, just trying to think of a situation where, you know, a saved person would be, for whatever reason, in the Catholic Church and then this is taking place and, you, you know, you're involved with this. Other people will see that and that's going to make your brother to offend and that's a sin to do that and to partake in that. Um, turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5. This is going to be almost the last place we're going to turn. Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> so with freedom does come responsibility. We're free from the law, but we need to make sure 
that we still still follow God's law. It's not it's important just because we're free from that curse doesn't mean that we should just live however we want in the sense that we're just going to going to disobey God's commandments. Galatians chapter 5 verse number 1 the Bible says stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. See Christ has freed you. If you're saying this morning Christ has freed you from that from, uh, from sin. Christ has freed you from that curse. He says, don't get entangled again in that yoke of bondage. You don't want to become um, servants to that sin. He says, behold, in verse 2, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Uh, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by, by faith. Now, we just got done hearing that the law is, you know, is bondage by, um, you know, being entangled at the yoke of bondage. And we've been freed from the law. But none of that means that we should not follow the law still. You know, um, you might look at it and, and it's like seemingly a contradiction because you say, well, if we're free from the law, then why do we have to follow the law? But, um... Basically, what a lot of these verses are talking about is trusting in the law for your salvation is going to damn you. Right? If you're trusting in your works, if you're trusting your obedience in the law, then you're not free from the law. You're going to be held to every last jot and tittle of that law. And that's why he says, you know, if, you're, if you think you need to be circumcised to be saved, then, hey, you need to follow the whole law to be saved, and you're going you're gonna to fall under that curse if that's what you're trusting in is the law. Because that, and that's where he follows up um, in verse 5, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. It's that faith in Christ that saves us, that frees us from the curse of the law, because we can't, we're not perfect, we can't keep the whole law. We're not justified by the law. We're justified by faith, and it's the grace of God. Jump down to verse 13 of Galatians 5. The Bible reads, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And what it boils down to, this, this concept of, of being free from the law yet following the law, the law and liberty are inseparable. Being free and having that freedom is inseparable from, from God's law. The Bible says in James 1.25, it says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. It's referring to the law of liberty. God's law and obeying God's law is what's going to keep us free. It's that truth from God's commandments. It's the truth from God's law that makes us free. The last place we'll turn, turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is that big, long chapter in the book of Psalms, the longest chapter in the Bible. We're going to be in verse 41. We're going to start reading in verse 41. And Psalm 119 is all about God's law. The whole, that whole psalm is all about God's law and His commandments and, and how great they are. Look at verse number 41. The Bible reads, Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. So shall I keep the law continually forever and ever. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings, and will not be ashamed. And I will delight myself in thy commandments which I have loved. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. 
God's laws are what provide us with liberty. And on the surface, this may seem contradictory, but it's really not. Um, we cannot have freedom and liberty without laws. We need to have laws, God's laws in place. because, And, and here's why you think about it. God's laws are all, we read earlier, it's summed up by, you know, loving your Lord, the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and by treating your neighbor as yourself, basically. That's how all of God's laws, what God has created for us, can be wrapped up into those two commandments. It's loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to kill them. You're not going to commit adultery. You know, you're not going to do all these different things that are, that are violating somebody else and infringing on, on, on their rights and on their well-being. Those are essentially what, what it boils down to, what God's laws boil down to. And we need to be protected from other people just infringing on us, which is the whole purpose of the law, is, is to protect yourself so that you can go out. I mean, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to go out. And if you want to dig a hole, you can dig a hole. If you're doing all these different things with your property and your stuff and, and, and your life, you shouldn't be infringed on doing any of those things as long as you're not hurting or doing harm unto anybody else. You should be free to do whatever it is that you want to do as, as long as it's not affecting other people. And the Bible says in Psalm 119, 45, where we just were, he says, I, and I will walk at liberty. Why am I going to walk at liberty? Because for I seek thy precepts. God's precepts, God's laws. If you want to be free, we need to seek God's laws and just follow them and obey them. And God's laws are very simple. I mean, this book is not that big. There is not very many laws contained in this book. God does not just, just really creep into our lives and just try to micromanage every single detail of our life. He gives us basic laws to live by. Um, there, you know, there's, there's not that many in here. I mean, the book of the law, the book of Moses is, is really short in comparison to the rest of the Bible. It's, it's, not, it's not that big. Yet today we live in a country that's got volumes and volumes and volumes of laws that not any one person knows all the laws that are on the books in this country today. But if we, need, if we want to be free, we need to first, first and foremost, we need to promote liberty by preaching the gospel, preaching the good news, preaching good tidings unto the people, unto people who are lost and are already under that curse of the law. We need to try to live your life as closely as possible to God's law. Seek his precepts. The Bible says here um, <clears throat> in verse 46, I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. We shouldn't be ashamed of God's word, of God's laws, of God's commandments. He says, I'm going to speak them before kings. You know, people who would be at the highest level of authority that a lot of people might be afraid of. Don't be afraid when it comes to God's word. And this is something that gets attacked. When people find out you're a Christian, they'll say, oh, well, do you believe? And, you know, people who hate God and hate the Bible will bring up all these various laws that fly in the face of today's society and today's culture. They'll say, oh, well, do you, do you, do you believe children should be put to death if they, you know, curse their father or mother? Well, you know what? That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that if, if a child smites or hits their parent, that they, should be, that they should be put to death. Now, we're not talking about one and two-year-olds, right? I mean, we ought to understand what God's law is talking about, but yes. And people, Christians today, like to back away from that stuff and say, oh, no, no they see, that, that was, and they try making excuses for God's word. We ought not to make excuses. You know, the Bible says that, you know, if a man lieth with mankind, lieth with a woman, he should be surely be put to death. His blood shall be upon him. That's what the Bible says. The Bible promotes the death penalty, and look, Today, that's not popular. That's not common teaching. That's not, you know, people will try to bring that up. Oh, well, do you think, you know, homosexuals should be put to death? Yes, I do. Do you believe? And, and fill in the blank. I mean, people will say all kinds of, because this country is getting more and more wicked. There's more and more ungodliness being promoted. And, and you know, oh, you think someone who commits adultery should be put to death? Yes, I do. That's what the Bible says. I'm not ashamed of God's laws. In fact, I love God's laws and I'm going to try to follow them as closely as possible because I want to be free. And I'm going to promote this and preach this word as truth to get other people to get on board and say, look, this is going to bring us a lot more freedom. You know, when this country was founded back in 1776, you look at the old laws that were in place that have since been changed and they line up 
very much with this book. Back then, the, the, the way this country was founded, and, and in the hearts of the mind of, of the men who founded this country, had a very good respect for God, and a respect for the Bible, and a respect for His laws. When we decide to just throw out God and say, we're just going to come up with our own laws, we're in trouble. Because where are you getting your authority from? We need to get our authority from God's Word, and we need to stick to that. And it, this country has experienced more freedom than just about any country throughout history. I mean, I believe in back the children of Israel under the judges probably had the most freedom because that was God's ordained, what God had ordained for government to be and for them to follow God as the king and the supreme ruler. And that's how we ought to live our lives and that's what we need to strive for and that's what we need to preach unto others. So if you want to make a change, if you, if you don't like the way things are going in this life, I'm not saying don't ever do anything political or anything like that. You know, I, I still follow and, and try to engage a little bit here and there, but that's not where we're going to see the, the greatest um, benefit. It's going to be reaching hearts. It's going to be reaching minds. It's going to start off with this afternoon going out and knocking on doors and preaching the liberty that comes with Jesus Christ and His shed blood for sin. We need to get through to the hearts of people because if they're still in their sins, if they're not saved... What does it matter if you change their politics? Who cares about that? Their soul is still destined for hell. We need to bring them the freedom. We need to preach liberty to the captives. We need to get people, first and foremost, get their souls free from that bondage of hell. And then, hopefully, we could, we could teach and train them God's word so that they could be made free indeed. And, and the more people we could do that, hey, that, that is just going to affect the rest of our of our country as a whole by reaching into the individuals now you can't change the whole world by yourself but you could reach individuals and we just have to to not get overwhelmed with the task and do what you can do reach who you can reach and just be dedicated to serving god and to and to preaching his his good message of, of uh, the truth and the gospel let's bow our heads for a word of prayer dear heavenly father lord i thank you so much for this opportunity um <laughs> As so many other times here, Lord, sometimes my words don't seem to come out the way that I intend. But Lord, I love liberty and I love freedom. I thank you so much for providing us with your word, with your truth, for preserving your word for us today. Even in 2014, dear God, after all these years, you have preserved your word perfect for us today. I thank you for that. And I thank you for making me free and for making us free through Jesus Christ, dear God, I pray that you would please help us to have the boldness not to be ashamed of your word, but to stand on your word as the truth, dear Lord, and to preach it unto others, dear God, not just to keep it for ourselves. I pray that you would please just help us to, to be stirred up, to care about other people that are captive in their sin. Dear God, that are, that are hell-bound, I pray that you would please help us to love those people, help us to spread the good news, and to bring them the truth, and, and to tell them, and help guide them, and show them how they can be made free, dear Lord, through your word. And I pray that you would please just continue to bless our church, and, and help us as we go out this afternoon to win souls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.